Hey guys, it's Barrett with the Kimby Camper. So today we're going to be talking about using our camper in northern Michigan in the winter time. So, you know, I don't talk about my personal life on here a lot, but I am a traveling nurse practitioner. I, I travel all along the southeastern United States and work where they need extra help at. And, you know, a lot of my travels are in the southern United States. Now, I don't, I don't overlap my camping with my job. A lot of times I do separate business trips there uh, and I don't take the camper. But all this is to say that I did end up having to take the camper to northern Michigan during the uh, middle of winter last year because last year, I think it was about September, my father had a stroke. Um, he actually wasn't doing that well. He was put on hospice. And I could tell for a while that I was going to be going up there quite a bit. And so I decided that I wanted to take my camper up there. Um, that way I would have my own space. You know, luckily during that time for work, I was working at a hospital like 45 minutes from my house. And so whenever I would go on my work trip, I would actually have some time to see my family. And then if I was to get like a week off, which happens about once a month for me, I would go to Michigan, help take care of my dad the best I could. But because of that, I wanted to take my camper up there. Now my stepmom actually thought I was a little bit crazy for this. You know, my dad and stepmom, they've always had a camper and they that's probably where I learned a lot of this lifestyle from. Um, and my dad's dad, my grandfather, he always, you know, at least uh, lived in an RV, you know, most of the year as well. And so kind of comes as a long lineage there. They were both class A people. I'm more of a, a toe behind type of guy. But you know, there's a lot of similarities and stuff. However, you know, I knew that taking a camper to Northern Michigan was going to be a little bit different. I do have experience with camping in the winter time. I have experience with backpacking in 20 degree weather and I've survived that and that's my stepmom kept saying you're going to be so cold and I was like you know I have slept in a hammock in 20 degrees and like I survived and in here I have a heater and stuff so I think I'll be okay. That being said I figured I'd learn quite a few things during this uh, extravaganza and I have and that's what we're here to share with you today. Now I will say that I thought I was going to be doing this a lot longer than I was um, sadly to say, um, the end of last year, my, my father did pass. And so I did decide to bring the camper back um, the beginning of December because the roads weren't too bad. They were a little bit slushy on the way home. But I figured that they would be a lot better than uh, when we came back over New Year's. However, all the snow had left temporarily over New Year's because it's kind of it's kind of like Tennessee weather. like it's real cold one day and then it's warm the next day who knows like weather's just weird here lately but there wasn't any snow when i went up in january so it would have been actually easier for me to tow the camper back then but let's go over what we learned in some different tips and tricks that i have for you so number one is the water system so you know it's not uncommon for me to camp in the winter time with my camper i winterize probably 10 to 20 times a year you know, a lot of people winterize the end of camping season and then they're winterized until the spring. I don't do that. Um, I use my camper. I pay for it. I'm going to use it every chance I get. This year I've not used it quite as much because of all the issues. So with my, um, the way that I do my winterization, which I have a video on up here, I mean, the winterizing this thing takes 10 minutes. So. It's no big deal. Like my plan was to go up there, use it for a week, winterize it, come home. Next time I go de-winterize it, start all over again. And for the most part, wouldn't have any issues there. And we'll go over more of the water issues in the freezing prevention and all that in just a minute. We'll start here really with my plan to stay warm. Now, I had a multi-prong approach to this on how I stay warm. Now, number one, my Cougar fifth wheel does have um, the climate guard, the winter package. Now, I will say that the winter package mainly consists of like a Reflectix layer over the RV underbelly. 
And it also has like the uh, tank heaters on the fresh tank, the gray tank, and the black tank. Now at home, I use a combination of heat with electricity and the furnace. I use electricity more when we go camping. Uh, we do have a fireplace. I do have a 50 amp camper, but usually I only have 30 amps of electricity. So 90% of the time I use a 30 amp cord so I don't have to get the big cord out. And the way that our normal wintering works um, is that we use the fireplace for heat, which doesn't put out as much heat as I would think. And we also have a portable air conditioner that has a built-in heat pump. So we use that a lot as well. Now that, because I only use the 30 amp service, I usually get the power from the pole and plug that air conditioner heat pump into that. And so because of the setup that we were at, my parents do have a 30 amp outlet. They did not have uh, another outlet close by that was on a different circuit. And so I didn't use the uh, heat pump that much. I did use it once. Um, you know, I was using the power watchdog and I was using the heat pump, the fireplace, and I got another little heater we'll talk about in a second. And it did fine for one night and then the next night it threw the breaker. And you know, it was, it was kind of pushing 30 amp service, but it was still right under, but I guess, you know, something was turned on in addition to that in the middle of the night that, that flipped the breaker. But all that being said, heat pumps are not very efficient, um, you know, when you start getting really cold. So that wasn't a good way to do it anyway. That, when you think about um, the furnace, I plan on using the furnace more anyway because, you know, it does have ducts that go down into the underbelly, which help prevent the freezing and such there as well. So that was kind of on my plan anyway. As I said, I did get a small heater. I went to Menards to find a heater just for my, my storage area where my wet bay is and stuff because I wanted to prevent freezing all I could. I did not use this heater when I wasn't there. I did not leave it running, obviously, whenever I was back in Tennessee or anything like that. But I wanted one that had a couple of features. Number one, I wanted to be able to run it on low because I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to use the whole power management thing. And number two, I wanted something that would spread that heat around a little bit. So this little fan that I got, it does auscultate, which is not, I don't really care about the auscultation as much, but it has a fan built into it. So it throws that heat out further a little bit. And that's what I was really aiming for. Now, since I was planning on using the furnace more, I actually thought about hooking up to my parents' big, large horizontal propane tank as it was right in front of the camper. And the gas company that they use is about a mile down the road. But, I mean, I was only doing this like a week at a time, so it wasn't really necessary. And when I learned that the gas there was about 30% cheaper for a fill up than it is here in Tennessee, I was like, there's no real reason to do this. I mean, I was paying as much to fill like a 30 pound tank as I usually pay to fill a 20 pound tank here in Tennessee. I don't know if that's all the supply versus demand or what's going on there, but it was quite a bit cheaper. The next part of my system of not running out of propane uh, was to use my Mopeka sensors. And those Mopeka sensors, I'm telling you, they work great. I have the Pro sensors, I have a video on it there. Um, I've not had any issues with the sensors falling off. You know, the bottom of my my propane bays are at least half open and the tank kind of sits over a ledge and I was worried that the sensors would fall off. But I have drove those sensors uh, probably seven or 8,000 miles now from here to DC to Louisiana, uh, down at New Orleans to South Dakota. They're on, they're, they're no issues. I never had any issues out of them. The, they're showing low battery now, I need to change them. But that way I always know how much propane that I have. Now, if you don't do this and you just want to do something for free, number one, don't waste your money buying the screw on gauges. They don't help you at all. Basically, they just tell you when the, when the tank's empty, which guess what, you can figure out yourself. But the other way to know when you're running out of propane and always have some left over is to just turn one of your tanks off. So that's what I used to always do. 
I just leave like the passenger side tank turned off, leave the driver side tank turned on. You know, even if it's 30 degrees in Michigan, it's freezing, you're running the heater, the furnace, furnace turns off at 2 a.m. because you're running out of gas, you go outside, turn the other tank on, furnace fires back up, no problems at all. And you have like, you know, a day or two, next day or two, go fill the other tank at your leisure. Now, if you don't do that, what happens is you think you're gonna keep up with it. You don't have the Mopeka system, so you don't really know. And next thing you know, it's always two or three o'clock in the morning, you run out of gas, no heat the rest of the night, no, no furnace heat anyway. And so, always be sure that you have some reserve even in, like if you leave both tanks open whatever you want to do just have a spare tank do something where you don't run out of gas in the middle of the night so then i want to keep the uh the pipes and stuff from freezing so number one is to use the tank heater so flipped all those on number two is to uh, insulate the pipes and such that are hanging out to prevent them from freezing so and i don't leave a water hose hooked up i think that you're just asking for trouble that way. You know, sometimes if you're full time and you want to use a winter hose or you want to uh, the heated hose, I think it's a waste of money. But if you want to make your own, even with like a heat tape and a water hose and pipe insulation, that's fine. Number one, you got to be sure to um, insulate the actual faucet because that's the next thing that's going to fail. And but there's no reason for it, like. Just fill your tank up every few days and your tank's inside more of an insulated space, especially if you've got a tank heater. It's doing the job for you. There's no reason to waste the money there. But the next thing was to uh, prevent any freezing of my water. So what we do is we went to the, the fresh drain, the low point drains, the hot and cold. Now those used to be in the middle of the camper on the bottom. I actually use some PEX pipe to bring that out to the side with some 90 degree valves. And when I did that, I put pipe insulation on them. So they, they should have been okay. But the actual valves is where you're gonna have an issue with freezing anyway. And so I took a towel and wrapped around those valves and put a big zip tie around them to help insulate them. And then I took one of those like styrofoam faucet covers and like put up over that and kind of secured that to there and i thought that that did a good job you know i will say that i went out there one day in winter time and filled the water tank off everything was fine and the next day like i didn't have any water i was actually looking for a busted pipe or something and it come to find out there was a little bit of the uh, i had forgot to insulate the fresh water drain and that was had a little bit of ice plug in there and so when I filled the water tank up, everything stayed. Well, the next day it got a little bit warmer. That ice melted, the tank drained out, and I didn't have any water. So I learned that whenever I had to go fill the tank back up because I was looking for a leak, and then I saw that all the water was coming out the drain. So, you know, got to be careful. But that was way better than finding a broken pipe in the camper. Now, that wasn't the end of my issue. You know, all of my wet bay stuff was pretty well protected, especially with the little heater that I had in there. Oh, I also got a, a thermometer. It's the same one that I use on my generator at home to monitor the temperatures, but it had the three little modules. And so I left like a, a couple of modules. I left a module like in the storage bay and I left one in my battery bay as well so that I knew the temperature out there. But the Achilles heel that I have is my freshwater tank in the water line both hot and cold that go to my kitchen sink which is in the back of the camper go from the wet bay back to the back of the camper okay because all of my stuff's in the front except for my freshwater drain and that sink and so because of that it did actually freeze the water line froze um, and so i couldn't use my kitchen sink for a little while now to remedy that, I do have to get back under the camper. I probably never run into this situation again because I'm not probably going to be going in the snow on purpose again, but I'm going to have a plan just in case I do. I have to get back into the underbelly because I connected all of my drain pipes together. 
It made the, like my rear tank used to be on a different drain line. I connected all those. I have to get back in there because I have a Valterra electronic valve that I have to add in there. And when I do that, I'm going to add insulation, pipe insulation to those three water lines. And then I have a long um, heat tape that I'm going to put in there. And that way, if the water does freeze up again, I can plug that heat tape in that will um, thaw those water lines out or plug it in to start with just to prevent it to start with but shouldn't have any more issues with that once i once i make those improvements now the next problem that i had that i've never run into before is needing to drain my tanks because i never stay anywhere longer than a week and i can always stretch my tanks out that long you know because of this i didn't know how long i was going to be up there i wanted a way where i didn't have to like hook my old camper up my my aunt and uncle actually have a campground about a mile from my dad's house, but I didn't want to have to drive down there. And there wasn't an easy drain line or anything to get to uh, right where the camper was. And so because of that, I did go online. I've actually found a tote tank, which I've never really been a fan of, but in this particular case, I thought it would help. So I found a cheap deal on it on Marketplace, drove an hour, picked that up. And I did use it, you know, it comes with uh, the little adapter so you can pull it behind. We pulled it behind the uh, UTV to take it where we could dump the tanks. Uh, you can also pull it behind your truck. I probably will fashion away so I can carry that with me so I have it if I need it. I mean, I already bought it and it doesn't weigh hardly anything. So if I can find a way to take it without having it be in my way, then, then it would be nice to have sometimes, I'm sure. And the final piece of my puzzle was my lithium batteries. Um, you guys know that lithium batteries can't be charged in freezing because it will hurt them. My line energy batteries actually have a pretty good uh, BMS system on there. So if it senses that they're freezing, it won't let the batteries charge at all. And I have these ultra heat battery warmers. I did a video about them before. When I did my battery upgrades and stuff, I added a third battery. Because of that, I actually had to add a relay and stuff that Ultra Heat um, supplied as well. And because of that, you know, I've never actually tested these battery warmers out, but I will say that there were plenty of nights below freezing, never had any issues with my battery charging, and the battery heater seemed to work really great. So let's talk about the lessons I learned during these trips. So number one, Thing, if you, especially if you're going to be somewhere all winter long, the best thing that you can do is some skirting. Um, you know, we're under our normal routine of like going somewhere for a week, it's not really worth it. But they say if people, especially people that use skirting in the winter time, they say that that dramatically decreases the amount of propane you're going through because it keeps those drafts down, keeps the wind from blowing up under the camper. It helps a lot of those freezing issues as well. Now there's plenty of skirting options. There's DIY options. Um, you know, these can look as professional or not as you want to want to and put time in. But a lot of people just use the foam insulating board. They use uh, the aluminum tape, HVAC tape to tape it to the metal skirting on the side and then put like some gravel or something along the bottom. It's not really recommended that you use like stacks of hay because that has rodent issues. Um, but if you're wanting something like more professional, there are a few different options. So the best option in my opinion for if you're gonna be moving around a lot are called air skirts. Now, honestly, I did reach out to a lot of these companies and ask them if they'd be willing to work out a promotional partnership. And a lot of them said that they, actually all of them said that they weren't really able to do that. I did have one company offer me an affiliate, um, but it's after you bought the, the product. Now, truthfully, at most I was going to be doing this for one season. So, you know, for me, it wasn't really worth $2,000, which is what a lot of these systems cost. Now, obviously if you live in a winter climate and you're going to be doing this a lot, then that's, you know, a different scenario. But as far as the air skirts go, you know, they're big cylinders of like just balloons, basically. And you blow them up, they wedge between the sides of your camper and the ground. And then they have some smaller ones that go from like side to side. 
and those you know seem to work okay I've, I've read some reports of some leaks and stuff um, but once you have all that the kinks worked out there they generally have very good reviews but it is something if you're going to be long term you're going to have to check on from time to time make sure that they're holding there make sure that they're good and secured and not blowing away there are a couple of other rv skirting companies out there the one that I would actually prefer and uh, promote more than any other is the one that offered me the, the affiliate deal, but it, it's the skirting company. So with the skirting company, it's the only reason that I say that I would pick them, number one, is that their skirting is the only one that I've seen that actually has insulation in it. So because it's got, I think it says R7 insulation inside the skirting, Obviously, it's going to be more protection than, than just a piece of uh, material. The second thing that I learned was about my kitchen pipes, where I told you that they froze up on my kitchen sink. I already went over my plan there, so I'm not going to cover that again. And as far as the third thing that I learned, uh, which I already knew, but you know, winter camping is about, number one, your preparedness. It's about your equipment. How well are you... Um, prepared to handle this and number two is about your mental fortitude like you know if you have that the gumption of like I'm going to do this and I'll learn from it and you know if something breaks I'll fix it you're going to be a lot better than you know I think I might be able to do this and then something breaks and then you think it's the end of the world like you know you're going to run into to obstacles here like when I run into my frozen pipe in the kitchen but the thing is, is you have to know how to fix it or know somebody that can fix it and deal with it and learn from it and prevent it from happening again. It's all you can do. So, you know, like I say, sadly, I didn't do this as long as I had thought that I was going to because my father did pass away. Um, and, you know, he's always in my heart. And it's... Uh, I'm still kind of getting used to being in the world without him, but, you know, it is what it is, and he lived a good life, and, you know, he taught me a lot of things that I carry with me every day, and so I try to pass some of those on to you guys, so thank you guys for being part of my family. Thanks for following the video. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button, hit those notifications, so next week's video will notify you when it gets released but thank you guys for for just being here with us do not forget to hit that subscribe button